Welcome to Episode 4 in our Radio Design 101 series. Today we're going to talk about RF oscillators, how they're made by applying positive feedback to a radio frequency amplifier, how they can be tuned either mechanically with a variable capacitor or electronically with a varactor diode. And we'll finish up with a little bit on frequency synthesizers and how modern oscillators are actually created. Let's start out by looking at the big picture. What are oscillators used for? Well, they're used in transmitters, but also in receivers, as we'll see. Here, we've got an oscillator that we've hooked directly up to an antenna. Don't do that unless you've got a license and know what you're doing. But if you did it, then what would happen is the antenna would develop electric fields and magnetic fields, and those would propagate. When it gets to the receiver, the electric field will introduce a voltage in the input circuits of the receiver, and as we'll see, we're going to use oscillators there as well. So here's a block diagram of a modern superheterodyne receiver. Sometimes these will be direct conversion receivers today, but they all use oscillators. In particular, what are called local oscillators. And here we've got the oscillator with the frequency FLO labeled next to it. On the transmitter side of things, sometimes we don't use the oscillator directly, but we use it in conjunction with what's called a frequency synthesizer to get a precise frequency out. And so here's a block diagram of a transmitter with that synthesizer that includes an oscillator in it, and then a modulator to take the voice or data and put it on that carrier wave, amplify it, filter it, and send it out the antenna. Don't do that unless you know what you're doing and have a license or certification to do it. Now, there are unlicensed frequency bands like Citizens Band, but the manufacturer has to guarantee that the equipment works and meets certain specifications. Now, this Radio Design 101 series, if you've seen some of the previous videos, you know that it's derived from a university course. And in that course, we had a series of semester projects that led to creating an entire receiver for the FM broadcast band. The local oscillator plays a key role in that, and that's what we're going to be focused on in this video. If you want to look at some of those other videos, just search for them, or there are some playlists out there as well. The Radio Design 101 has a playlist, and there's a companion series on the Nano VNA, which also briefly shows the Tiny Spectrum Analyzer, or Tiny Essay. So how do you make an oscillator? Well, it's pretty easy. In fact, sometimes you do it unintentionally when you're trying to make an amplifier. Here, I've taken an amplifier and applied positive feedback to it, and that created an oscillation, as you can see in the lower right-hand corner here. This is the tiny spectrum analyzer. It's sweeping from uh, 0 hertz to 200 megahertz. You can see a strong spectral line here, which is at 61.24 megahertz. How did we create that? I just added a capacitor from the output, which is on the collector node here, back to the input. This is a common base amplifier by virtue of the AC ground here at the base. So the input is on the emitter. This is a non-inverting amp, so it's fed back in phase, and it's positive feedback. Interestingly, it did work, although typically there's another capacitor to ground here that you need, as you'll see. But it did work. Here the capacitor is being held, and here it's oscillating. All right. And here's our topic outline for today's video. We're going to go into those oscillator basics in some detail, and in fact, we'll give you a complete design procedure for an oscillator. After that, we'll look a little bit at history. There's something called a Hartley oscillator and Culpitz oscillators. Then we'll introduce voltage-controlled oscillators, which are central to today's digitally controlled radios. And finally, crystal control, which is required to get accurate frequencies, but if you want those frequencies to vary, we need something called a frequency synthesizer. How to make an LC oscillator. We start with a tuned RF amplifier design, and that's been covered in the last video. What we do now is we add positive or in-phase feedback. It's important that the output of the amplifier, shown here with a gain AV, is fed back in-phase 
so that the signal builds up over time. And eventually it gets very large. And you could take the output from this node, for example. We can select the output node from different nodes in the circuit, as we'll see. But when we do take an output, we'll need to look at the loading that that puts on the amplifier because that's going to change the gain. Ultimately, we need to verify that the loop gain is greater than 1 so that when an output signal comes out here and is fed back and is amplified again, it gets bigger each time. This feedback network here is composed of a couple of capacitors, as we'll see, and that basically forms, you probably recognize this as a voltage divider. And that's done because we don't necessarily want to feed the entire amplified output back to the input. That would just really saturate this amplifier. So you can get better performance if you do something like this. Okay, these next few slides are kind of busy. And I recommend that you look at episode 3 especially because that's where this figure came from. I'm going to go through this pretty quick. Some of you have background in this, so you'll probably be able to follow it even if you haven't watched episode 3. In any case, here is the amplifier that we talked about there. It's a common base amp, as we said. There's a tuned circuit at the output. That's ultimately what will define the frequency that we oscillate at combined with the capacitors that we talked about in the previous slide. There's also here a matching network that feeds the signal out to a load. The input to this amplifier is down here. There's an input matching network, but when we make an oscillator, we're not going to use an input, so we're going to get rid of that. All we're interested in is the input impedance, which, as we've shown previously, is 1 over the transconductance of this transistor. All right. Also, in that previous video, the gain we said was GM, the transconductance, times R, where R, in this case, is this R4 value in parallel with what we see looking out through the matching network toward the load. So that ends up being R4 over 2, because you got two things in parallel. You should probably also think about the parallel parasitic resistance in inductors and make sure that it's not too low and messes up your gain. So once you have an RF amplifier designed and you understand its input impedance and its output impedance, it's very easy to make an oscillator. Just add that capacitive voltage divider if it's a common base circuit. For other circuits, we'll see it could get a little bit more complicated to do the feedback network. Here, the voltage divider CA and CB feeds the output signal from the collector back to the input on the emitter. It will oscillate if the loop gain is greater than 1, but you also need the reactance of CA, here called X sub CA, to be less than the input resistance of this common base amplifier. Without doing that, this isn't going to be a good capacitive voltage divider. You'll have phase shifts, you may not have enough loop gain, etc. However, it's a lot easier than that. Assuming you select CA so that the reactance is less than RN, all you have to do is set CB equal to CA. Or you could even set CB equal to CA over 3 or CA over 4. And that will generally make the loop gain greater than 1. So in our little example where we took a capacitor and fed signal from the output back to the input, as shown in the right-hand schematic diagram here, we didn't have a CA. We had, in this circuit, the C1 value, which is 82 picofarads, in series with the 40 nanohenry to ground, and there was no input applied, so it was just this circuitry there. So why did it work? Well, number one, you've got capacitance adding to this node, and so this amplifier, which is originally tuned at 100 megahertz, is now working at 60 megahertz. And at that frequency, it turns out that this capacitive reactance is bigger than this inductive reactance. And so the net is that this circuit looks like a capacitor of 160 picofarads. Now here's where the learning really happens in a university course, or when you're watching this video. If you want to be able to design an oscillator and make it work for something like the FM Broadcast Band Radio semester project, then there's a little bit more to it. 
So I would advise you, if you're interested in that, to maybe freeze this slide and read it over. I'll talk through it real quick, but perhaps freeze it and read it over carefully. If you're not interested in that level of detail, then just skip ahead. There's a lot of good stuff coming up. All right, so here's the procedure. We're going to delete L1, which was this capacitor in the matching network, and then ground C1, and that basically then puts a CA from this node to ground, just like in the oscillator design that we saw earlier. Then I'd recommend increasing R3, which is this bias resistor here, from 180 to 360. Um, the 180 gave 5 milliamps in this oscillator. It's easier to design the ultimate product if we decrease that current because that will lower these capacitance values and that will change the loading up here. It's just better. So then all we have to do is make CA give a reactance less than 20 ohms at 87 megahertz. Set CB equal to one-third CA. We could set it equal, but we're going to set it to one-third because that'll work. And also then the net result of these two in series will be as low as possible. It's still going to load the LC tank circuit up here, so we're going to have to adjust. This was like 500 in the matching network. These two are actually combined into a single inductor. And in any case, that inductance has to resonate with the total capacitance to give the frequency we want. And we want to do that to resonate at 87 megahertz. Then we build it and test it and make sure that things are working. After that, we're going to add what's called varactor tuning, which is using a tuning diode to make this thing electronically tunable in frequency. And once you've added the tuning varactor diode, you probably have to readjust L, etc. Okay, our next topic in the outline here is going to take us on a little journey through time, hopefully very quickly. Historically, this is the first patent that I'm aware of on an oscillator. To understand this, number one, we need to recognize that they drew the schematics weird back then. This uh, vacuum tube here, which is a triode, is kind of on its side. Today, this whole circuit would be rotated 90 degrees counterclockwise so that ground is at the bottom and other things are at the top. The cathode, there is no cathode, there's a heater in the early vacuum tubes, emits electrons and those go toward the plate, which is item 7 here, and this forms a common cathode amplifier. So in a common cathode amplifier, the input signal is on the grid, which is shown here, item 8, and the output signal is on the plate. And so that output signal is loaded with an L down here at the bottom and a C, which is drawn weirdly. Uh, this is a variable capacitor in the old style of drawing. And that creates an LC tuned circuit, which defines the frequency. But the L that resonates with this C is actually the series combination of this one down here at the bottom, which is part of a transformer, and this one up here at the top. So think of series resonance and currents going through all of this. The current which goes through this one, if it's in this direction as shown, creates a negative sinusoid, an inverted sinusoid, at this node here, which is essentially the collector signal. But then, because this current goes through here and it goes through the capacitor and the capacitor has a different phase relationship than the inductor, it gets inverted and so now it's a positive signal over here. That positive signal comes back to the grid and so it's out of phase with the plate signal. But remember, for a common cathode amplifier, the gain is minus GM times R, so there's another inversion from the grid to the plate in this design. And so you have two inversions, and so you basically get a loop gain which is in phase. And that's how this thing oscillates. Coming forward, here are some modern Hartley designs. The one on the left using a bipolar junction transistor, and the one on the right using a depletion mode JFET. I'm not going to go through the details here. I would 
recommend maybe you freeze this and look at it and think about it. That's the way we learn. You can also go to the link that's shown here. That's where this figure comes from. The one on the right, take a second here to comment that this is a what? Common drain amplifier. So the output signal is on the source, which is here at the bottom. The input is on the gate. The gain of a common drain amp is one at most. And so how do you get a loop gain greater than one? Well, you do it by using a tapped inductor matching network. So as the signal comes out here on the source, it goes through this tapped inductor matching network, which transforms from a low impedance here to a high impedance at the gate. In the process of transforming, as we've seen in the previous video, the voltage is also stepped up. So you get a gain of one from the gate to the source, and then a gain greater than one in this matching network, and then it goes back into the gate. So that was fun, but I don't really do Hartley oscillators, and I think most people don't these days, because these things fundamentally require two inductors, or at least a tapped inductor. And people generally don't like inductors these days because they are more complicated or because they don't integrate well on chips, etc. So we're not going to do that. Instead, let's look at Culpitz oscillators. So on the left here is a common base Culpitz oscillator. This is the one we talked about before. The arrow here in blue shows the signal coming into the emitter node and going out on the collector node and then looping back through the capacitive voltage divider. As you know from previous videos, the gain of this amplifier, common base, is GM times R, but it's non-inverting, so there's a plus here. We have some gain, so we don't want to feed too much signal back, so we do a voltage slash impedance step down using these two capacitors. On the right-hand side is a common collector Culpitz oscillator, and it's basically like the Hartley one that I showed earlier in the sense of matching up in order to get the loop gain that you need. But notice that we have tapped capacitor matching network rather than tapped inductor. One thing I should point out in these figures is that this is a bypass cap. It's not labeled, but it's just a large capacitance. Uh, same thing over here on the right-hand side on the power supply and on the base. This one here is a coupling capacitor, so it's also not labeled, but think of it as being large. All this is is a DC block so that this inductor doesn't short out the bias voltage on the base. So the resonance is these two capacitors in series in parallel with this tuning capacitor in parallel with L1. This one does not play in because it's just a DC block or an AC coupling cap. Very low impedance, so the net of it in series with L1 is just L1's impedance. So a really good thing to do when you're learning circuits is to look at some existing designs. And so in that vein, I have put a schematic for the oscillator that's in one of the ham radios I have. This is a SB101. Actually, this is a 102, but this schematic is from a 101. And it's a linear master oscillator schematic. I think it goes from like 5 to 5.5 megahertz or something like that. What kind of an oscillator is this? Is this a Hartley or is it a Culpitz? That's the first thing you want to know. Second one is you want to look at it and stare at it and try to understand it. Well, you got two capacitors in series here, and it looks like they're feeding the signal back from the cathode to the grid, which is kind of similar to what we just saw. Now, there's a lot of other details here. There's these capacitors, which are probably here for temperature compensation or something. There's the tuning capacitor, which is actually tied to this knob over here. And this one, I'm guessing, is a trimming capacitor. Not sure. But anyway, freeze this, think about it, and then we'll move on. Moving up to a slightly more modern design, one that uses bipolar junction transistors <laughs> instead of tubes, um, here is a FM broadcast receiver that I own. And you can see a variable capacitor here. It's actually 
a set of plates here and here that are for AM, so we're not using those. And then there is this set, three plates here, three plates here, and three plates here. What's that for? The one in the center tunes the oscillator. These two ones on the outside tune the input bandpass filter and the output bandpass filter that flank the low noise amplifier. This forms what's called a tracking preselect filter in the front end of the receiver. But let's focus on the center one. It is used to tune the oscillator. And where is it? That's down here. And I've given it away here. This is a common collector culpits oscillator. Where's CA and CB? Well, it's this capacitor and this capacitor. And this one is actually in parallel with some capacitance inside this transistor. So when you're designing these things, you kind of have to think about that, but not too much. Where is the output of this oscillator taken from? Well, it's taken from the base node. And remember, this is a higher voltage here, AC voltage, than the signal at this node here at the emitter. And so it's big. So that's a good place to take it from. Follow this line and note that it goes through C8 here, which is a very interesting value. It's 0.47 picofarads, probably one of the smallest capacitors I've ever seen in a circuit. Why is it so small? Well, for two reasons. Number one, this, as we'll see in episode five of this series, is a mixer, and it only needs a few hundred millivolts, 100, 200 millivolts to operate. Meanwhile, the signal over here is volt level and amplitude. So we put a high capacitive impedance on that path to do some voltage division. Also, this small capacitance will not detune this network and it will not load this network very much when it's connected to this mixer. Now, to move further ahead in time, we need to get away from this mechanical tuning. As you know, all the radios built today are electronically tuned. In fact, you've got a cell phone and it's got radios in it and nobody even thinks about it, but the microcontroller is tuning an oscillator and how is that done? That's what we're gonna talk about next. So that's done with what are called voltage controlled oscillators or as you'll see, we'll refer to them as VCOs. How are those done? Well, you need a capacitance which can be electronically tuned by a voltage. And those are called varactor diodes. Many of you may know this, but let's take a quick look at this one. It's got two varactor diodes in one package because there's three leads here. And this node up here at the top if we make it positive with respect to either pin 2 or pin 1, then the voltage across this diode will be in reverse. And so the diode will not conduct. Instead, it will just exhibit some capacitance. And the more voltage we put across the diode in reverse, the lower that capacitance becomes. How do you know what the capacitance is and how low it becomes? Well, you need the data sheet. And here I've taken the diagram out of the data sheet, figure one, and you can see that at one volt reverse, it's about 43 picofarads. That's for each of these diodes. You could do two of them and get twice that. Whereas for five volts, say, it's 20. And this is what we'll use to make our tuning in our FM broadcast receiver. Now here, the tuning is done with the potentiometer. You can see on the lower right here, we have a potentiometer, and then this is the oscillator circuitry. And here's the potentiometer in the schematic. And what we do is we take that voltage on the wiper of the potentiometer, which can vary from ground or zero up to whatever VDD is, let's say it's five volts, and feed that through this resistance labeled R choke. Now, a lot of times this would be an inductor, but resistors are cheaper. And all we really need here is something like 100 K ohms, something big. Why? Because we have AC oscillation signals here, and we don't want those to come over here to the pot, and when the pot's all the way at the bottom, to get shorted to ground. So we put this 100 K ohm resistor. It doesn't affect the voltage from getting to this varactor diode because there's no current through here because this is a capacitance and this is a capacitance. And so it serves the purpose of choking off the RF signal from shorting out to ground 
or getting loaded by this pot while allowing the DC voltage to get to the Varactor diode. And that's how this works. Now before we leave this slide, let's take a look at this circuitry. We've got the oscillator board here. We've also got an auxiliary board here. That's the optional synthesizer that students can build and add to their radio. And we'll take a look at that at the end of this video. When we use that, we would get rid of this potentiometer and just feed a signal from it in here. And the synthesizer would put the right voltage on this diode to go to the frequency that it's commanded to by the microcontroller in our radio. So we get a nice digitally tuned radio. This next slide shows how oscillators are typically built on chip. So let's walk through it briefly. This is an oscillator built around what's called a cross-coupled differential amplifier. That's these transistors here at the bottom. They're essentially common emitter amplifier stages. The biasing is a little unusual here because of the use of two transistors to create complementary outputs, out plus and out minus. But the rest of it is fairly straightforward and should look familiar. We've got tuning diodes and inductors, and so there's the resonance. The output signal from these common emitter amplifiers is on the collector, and so this one feeds over to the opposite side, and then that feeds to this collector and back to here, so there is a loop gain here, and I'll let you work through that. In many situations today, integrated circuits will use MOSFETs instead of BJTs, and on the left-hand side over here, I've got the same thing with MOSFETs. Now finally, let's talk about oscillator stability, how exact the frequency is and how much it drifts over time. That brings up the topic of crystal oscillators and synthesizers. To make an oscillator whose frequency does not drift much over time, the classic method was to use what's called a crystal, typically made out of quartz. And here you can see some pictures of crystals. Uh, this one is probably the best one to look at. It's in a package like this, but I saw it open. And there's a circular piece of quartz here, which is coated on one side with metal, and it's coated on the other side with metal. So it's a two-terminal device, and you can see the lead sticking out here. Often, that crystal, whose schematic symbol is shown here, reminiscent of looking at the side view with the quartz here and the metal plate top and bottom, is used in a common collector culprits oscillator configuration in place of the inductor. And why is that? The model for this is shown in an application note that I pulled from the web, and this is the electrical model for the crystal. CO is the capacitance between those two plates that we see explicitly. The rest of these components are what are called motional values. So C1 and L1 represents a resonance, which is actually physically done with the piezoelectric properties of the crystal. There are stress and strain waves that move in the crystal. The result is that you have an effective capacitance here in the femtofarad range, an effective inductance in the millihenry range, and a resistance maybe 10 ohms or something. The reactance of these is very large because of their effective values, and therefore the Q, the quality factor of this thing, can be like 50,000. But we don't use this as the resonant circuit by itself. Instead, what we use is the fact that there is a series resonance here and a parallel resonance. They're very close to each other. This is the series resonant frequency. This is the parallel resonant frequency. And between these two points may be only a few hundred hertz or less at, say, 10 megahertz. And so somewhere between here is where it's going to oscillate because between the series and parallel resonant frequencies, it acts inductive. And only when it acts inductive with the right value will it resonate with these capacitors in the culprit's oscillator. So it's going to oscillate, say, at this inductive reactance value, which is right here, and at this frequency. And because it's quartz and the 
mechanical stability of quartz versus temperature is very good, that frequency is not going to shift much. And that's why we use crystals. So we get a nice constant frequency out of our oscillator. To get an even more constant frequency out, we can use what are called temperature compensated crystal oscillators, or in short, TCXOs. Now, if you're following along here and thinking critically, you might have picked up on an important point, which is that now we have a crystal, which is at a fixed frequency. How do we tune our radio? Well, in the old days with CB radios, they had like 23 different crystals, which is very expensive and very big, so we don't do that these days. Instead, what we use is what's called a frequency synthesizer. This is a circuit board that is available to the students where we have a synthesizer chip. We'll get into the details of that in a moment. And a microcontroller which programs that tells it what frequency to go to. The synthesizer chip does some magic that puts the right voltage out onto this thing called a loop filter. And that goes over to the board and tunes the radio to the right frequency. How does that magic happen? Well, you've got to have a signal coming back from the oscillator that can be fed back into this chip and compared with a reference and make it precise. Where's the reference? Well, that's our TCXO, which you can see down here. And to tune this particular radio, we have a button. So every time you press the button, it goes to a different channel. Of course, you could have displays. You could do this with an Arduino, et cetera, et cetera. As time marches on, things are becoming more and more integrated. Here, I've got a data sheet for a transceiver chip. It's the SI4432 is the one I'll pick. Why? Because under applications down here, they list all kinds of things you could do with this. But they didn't list tiny spectrum analyzer. But uh, if you got one of those tiny spectrum analyzers, we showed a picture of it before looking at our oscillator, uh, that's actually built with these chips. And over here on the right hand side is a typical application diagram showing how it's configured. Uh, this is a complete transmitter and receiver in one chip. It shares an antenna. We've gone through the theory behind all of this circuitry here that connects the antenna to the chip in previous video. The crystal for this thing is up here. And the frequency synthesizer is one piece of what's inside this chip. All controlled from a microcontroller, probably with a display somewhere. But our focus is on oscillators and at this point on synthesizers. Here is an on-chip oscillator that's inside the chip and the frequency synthesizer is all of this other stuff. So it starts with a crystal oscillator. It says 30 megahertz. When I read the data sheet, it sounds like that's divided down to 10 megahertz coming into this phase frequency detector. What that's doing is it's monitoring the VCO output frequency, dividing that frequency by an integer n. This just uses digital counters and comparing that to the 10 megahertz reference over here. This phase frequency detector will initially compare the two frequencies. And if this frequency, which is a divided down version of the output frequency is not correct, then it will issue some pulses to what's called a charge pump. And that basically puts some current pulses out to this thing called a loop filter. And think of this as a capacitor to ground so that these pulses of current will either charge it up or if they're sinking current, then it will pull charge off the capacitor and lower the voltage on the capacitor. So this system can adjust the voltage that's on this capacitor, which is the voltage which controls the voltage controlled oscillator. Now, when all of this works, can't go through the equations here because this is like a one semester course or an entire book. But essentially, when all of this works, this voltage is correct. And you get this relationship that the output frequency is n times the reference frequency. Remember, the reference frequency is 10 megahertz over here. Now, if that was all there was to it, then you'd be able to tune in steps of 10 megahertz. <clears throat> so for example, you could hit 100 megahertz by setting n to be 10 in this divider so that 10 megahertz times 10 is 100 megahertz. But the next step would be 110 megahertz because 
you'd change this to 11. And then you have 11 times 10 megahertz, which would be 110 megahertz. So how do you hit other frequencies? Well, that's why there's this thing here called a delta sigma modulator. That forms what are called fractional in architectures in these designs. Essentially, what that does is allow you to get in values which are not just integers, hence the word fractional in. So you could have an in value instead of 10 or 11, you could have 10.5. And that could be achieved, for example, by dividing by 10 for a while and then dividing by 11 for a while, 50% of the time at each. If you mix that up a little bit, you can hit other values as well. Now, the downside of doing that is that it's super complicated, but it also creates what are called spurious outputs. And here's an example of that. This is almost our last slide in today's video. What we've done here is take the tiny SA and put it into output mode, which means that you can use it as a signal generator. And I've set it at 99.6 megahertz, just for this example. And I fed it into a very good quality spectrum analyzer that I have. And you can see the output frequency here is at 99.6 megahertz. But there are some other signals coming out. These are called spurs, spurious outputs. And notice that they're only about 45 or 50 dB down from the peak. That can cause problems in both transmitters and receivers. Perhaps we'll do a video sometime where we'll go into performance measures for radios. This is a performance problem. One other issue you can see here, if I look at the lower right spectrum plot, there could be other spurs. This is when I've tuned to 100 megahertz, and so the spurs are a little bit different, but they're still only about 50 dB down, some of them. There's also this, what's called phase noise here, and that can cause some problems as well. This is the downside of doing this oscillator and all the other stuff, but mainly the oscillator on chip. If you do the oscillator on chip, then what you have is an inductor inside this thing, which is super small. And if you watched our other videos, you know that big Qs don't come in small packages. Big Qs are required to have very precision oscillators and also to have ones that have what are called low phase noise. All right, that's all we got time for today, except for a quick preview of where we're going. Here's where we've been. We've talked through these. I would recommend, if you're interested in learning this in depth, that you go back over the parts that you want. But what we're going to do in the next episode to head towards our overall project of an FM receiver is we're going to talk about mixers and IF filters, but mainly about mixers. So that's it. I hope that wasn't too long. I hope you stayed with me to this point. Uh, leave a comment below if you think these videos are too long or if they're okay, and if you have any questions. So I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope it was useful to you, and I will try to get another video out in a little while.